So welcome everyone. I know that there are a few more people coming in, um, but we will look to start. There's just a kind of a few housekeeping bits that we do um, quite religiously on these. So um, those that are entering won't miss too much uh, for the first couple of minutes. So welcome to our, our next series of webinars, which look at community engagement with our first looking at in your neighborhood, do you have common unity? So for those of you who joined us throughout the month of May, um, we had um, the privilege of having Charlotte, one of our FA club consultants join us to deliver on the marketing and communications um, series. This time around, we've got another one of our FA club consultants, um, Russ Smith, who will be joining us for the next four weeks. And I will introduce Russ in due course. So, um, who am I? Who's this uh, this strange individual talking to you on this Wednesday evening? My name is Danielle Warns. I am the National Club Services Manager um, for the FA um, Foot Association. So, uh, just over a year into the role now, and my role is looking at providing support services and resources guidance for your wonderful sales out there that look after the beautiful game that is currently at standstill. But the news is bright and things are picking up, which is fantastic to see. Um, if you have missed one of our webinars, so we've, this is webinar number eight. If you've missed one to seven and you would like to find out more information, please don't hesitate to drop the program at the FA.com and email. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Hopefully I've captured everyone before um, they've entered into the webinar this evening, but if your microphone does seem to be um, having a white outline through it rather than a red outline, um, please do look to click that and change the microphone out outline from white to red. If your video camera is on, if I could just ask that you switch it off, nobody can see you and it will just help with the connection and um, bandwidth. This is being recorded as we speak. So the clearer the content, hopefully um, the better it will be for viewing post today. Um, as mentioned, the slides will be as they have been for all webinars, emailed out to yourselves before the end of the weekend. So a nice bit of weekend kind of reading or recapping um, for those that might not have uh, been able to join us this evening, or if you wanted to rewind and catch something that you might have missed. And any questions, there is an opportunity at the end of the webinar to have your questions answered by either Russ or our two special guests this evening, or myself, if I can help. Um, please do pop them in the chat. Um, we will look to monitor that throughout. So you might get a response during the webinar, but we'll try and keep them all towards the end so everyone is fully across the questions that are being asked. So I did just go through some of the webinars that we have done previously, but if there is anything on the screen that takes your fancy and you haven't been able to catch the webinars on these different topics, I've mentioned please do contact clubs program at the fa.com and i'll be sent, able to send you all the relevant resources information just to add to that we have now started to collate some really good case studies on some of these topics so please do check out the link at the bottom right and you'll be able to see um, all of these topics in real life scenarios in a bit more of a bite-sized chunk again something that hopefully you'll be able to take away share with your committee um, and just capture more information. So as I said, this series looks at community engagement and the topics obviously today are all about common unity with next week looking at the power of your network um, and individual skills. On Wednesday the 17th, part three, we'll look at the relationships, education and institutes that you can connect with, work collaboratively with and hopefully support your club or league. And the finale on Wednesday the 24th of June looks at places, spaces and faces. Um, I, I, uh, I definitely suggest going away after today and try and say that super quickly three times and see what happens. But it's all around what happens in the wider community and how you can connect all of those three elements and your club, um, hopefully for the greater good of your community. So as I said, we were privileged last week to be joined by one of our FA club consultants, Charlotte. And this week and for the next three weeks, we will be joined by Russ. Russ, the stage is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, for those who might need some linguistic training, um, 
I am from the black country part of the world. So I will try to speak slow and with less yam tones so that you can understand what I'm saying. Um, and thank you for hosting this series. And something that you know, see on the screen, I've worked in coaching and community for 20 years. And, you know, as, as a lot of us, those things kind of twin together. And in my experience, I've kind of worked in a range of settings, really. So I don't know if any of you came across maybe about 20 years ago, something called New Deals for Communities, which was labour government investment of regeneration, education, themes, etc. Uh, I worked on a programme on that with football, which was with the FA. Uh, that was in West Bromwich. I've worked in schools. I used to be a head of community and a, a sports a kind of development manager with clubs. We set up clubs. I also worked in other sports as well. So we set up a netball club and basketball club as well as football uh, in those periods in Greets Green in West Bromwich. Um, worked for West Bromwich Albion. Um, and then, you know, took a bit of a change and worked for uh, a Sport England theme with areas of deprivation, again, predominantly in the black country. Uh, I work at university now and that's predominantly through It'll be different, you know, I want to make a difference in the black country, but I'm also a committee member of a league. So the league I sit on is called the Stairbridge District Youth League. Uh, my two children play in that league too, in quite big clubs, a club called Cuford and a club called Pierce Olympic. Uh, and I'm a committee member there and I've been for the last three years and I help them out with football development as my overview really. So that's just a little bit about me. So you get to know kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, and to align in some of these things, really. So if we move to the next slide, if that's OK. Uh, we're going to be joined today by two special guests, as Daniel says. Um, one of the clubs I've been working with over the last 18 months is Solly or Moores. And Becky will be on the line, so we'll get to meet her soon. And some of the things they're going to showcase to you today is the work that they've done off the pitch. So to connect more with health, uh, employability, um, charitable work, just stuff to kind of grow what they do. And these things haven't happened by accident. They've had to kind of map their assets, build connections and relationships to do that. So Becky will be uh, talking us through that in a little bit. And then followed by my um, good colleague, Luke. Uh, and Luke will be engaging that wider work that the County FA has done, but also more importantly, how they support clubs like Solihull or, for example, some of the work I might do in a league, etc., to kind of bring that community message together and the power that football can have and that wider outcome for community. Uh, Daniel mentioned the four uh, webinars. The key really for this one tonight is a really good overview to get you thinking, you know, maybe to share some of your bits at the end and get, you know, curious of what, what is community? Because a lot of the time, and maybe football's been a bit of the problem here, is what we may have had as community has been that charter standard status. So how people playing from various um, backgrounds may be, with the, you know, the tick in the box, but it's so, so wider than that. And to help with the growth, sustainability, um, networks and skills that you could have is a part of the aim of this series to widen that. So my first question for you, uh, and if you can do, just, just maybe use that chat function in this. So I'm going to ask you a question. And in the last 10 weeks in our lockdown period, have you gone for a walk somewhere in that area you had a day or in those two sets that you could do a bit later on? And have you gone somewhere by where you live and you've gone, I didn't know that was here. Oh, I didn't know that was there or something new. Has that happened to you in the last 10 weeks? Now, whilst you're thinking about that, and you might just note something down and go, yeah, I found that there was a river or I found there was a building or something else that was there. This has happened to me a lot. And in that 10-week period, it's knowing what is those assets that's in and around where you are. And a good example for me, just whilst you're thinking and typing is, I didn't even know there was a river in Dudley and that's where I live and just going for walks or on my bike or whatever I did for that hour I was to be able to find new things and I suppose the underlying tone to start us off for this series is sometimes we don't know what's there 
and you know it's not going to come to us sometimes we have to bridge the gap and come to them really it's that whole point of finding out um what's there i saw once brunswick park i know that place very well in the chat there yeah i've been there um a whole family history from wednesday so that's a good one so you know you think about that it could be your parks buildings etc you might have seen on your ways a mountain bike track okay danielle yeah did you know it was there before danielle no, so it's uh, it's brand new. So I'm new to yeah. the area as well. So really understanding kind of what assets are out there for me is 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 really new at the moment. Cool. Okay, we just had another one just come up quickly, which said uh, a community hall. Nathan found, yeah, absolutely. But you might not have known about it. Uh, and Neil walks all the time. I found a class by football field. Yeah, might be something you didn't know that was there. And this is, you know, this is the point I'm trying to, trying to make, really. We don't know a lot of the things that's in and around us unless we actually map it, have a look, or go out and try to maybe see what can help us as clubs or as leagues on the other way. Well, how can they help us too as well? <laughs> so I mean, lots of things are new for you, yeah? Five minutes here, Pat. So if we have that mindset going into what we're going to talk through, this will really help us. Because there's a lot of the world, and especially in the world of post-COVID-19 and football coming back, where we're actually going to have to find these new areas, these new pathways, organisations, um, supports. Could be, you know, one of the big ticking time bombs at the moment might be, you know, leaking into mental health, as an example. And, you know, Solly or Moores can explain a little bit more about that later. But we might not know about that. Because predominantly we're, we're football clubs and we deal with people coming to play football. So it's that wider impetus that we're going to look into. Uh, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of a, a plan or a tool that you can build for yourself along the way as other clubs sharing what they do in the community. OK, so if we go to the next one. So we've set the tone. We're thinking about what's called the ABCDs. And this for you guys is going to be your kind of model that we talk through uh, as we go. So again, we're going to use the chat function. And I'm going to say, what does that mean? A, B, C, D. And we're thinking about community. What do you think that is? And I'm sure Danielle can find a prize for the first person who gets it right. I'm sure there's a T-shirt knocking about somewhere. What are the A, B, C, Ds when it comes to community? Stick it in the chat box if you think you've got an idea and you could win a T-shirt. Approach, okay, good start, Anita. Thanks for being brave and starting us off. Inclusivity, yeah. I'm not telling you whether these are right or wrong, by the way. I'm just uh, rewarding you for being brave and having a thought. Well done. Community. Oh, I think someone might have won a T-shirt. I'm not going to say who yet, though. Some good answers there. I'll just give it one more minute. Some good stuff. And they'll, yeah, well done. Okay. Um, Luke, I think that's how to object. Yeah, Luke Burton. Well done, Luke. Danielle, I'm sure you can find him a T-shirt or something, right? Asset-based community development is uh, is what the acronym stands for, all right? So if we go to our next slide. And what that means is what's in and around you and how do you find it and what, what element can it add to you and your club? So an example, I've used that picture purposely. Sorting the Lego. You know, because the Lego sometimes, you know, I don't know if anyone's got kids, it's a pain to sort. But if you put the greens with the greens and the yellows with the yellows and the whites with the whites and the blacks with the blacks, you're going to have it sorted in a way that supports each other or, you know, complements. And that's kind of the key that asset based community development's all about. And some of the bits about asset based community development, just to help you out and set a tone for it, it focuses more on community assets and strengths rather than problems and needs. So rather than looking at the negatives that you need to plug, 
it will kind of help out focusing on those positive things that can complement each other. It can identify and mobilise individual and community assets. Could be skills, could be about facilities. And also build communities from the inside out. And relationships is kind of the big deal that glues it all together. So when you put your yellow with the white, it's probably going in the right place rather than you just having all the Lego mixed up. And the model kind of came about through, you know, I'm not going to bore you with research here, but it's from uh, Chrisman and McKnight. It's from the 80s, really, and 80s and 90s, and worked in a lot of um, developing communities in, uh, in America. But this research came and has been underpinning a lot of the work in England, in my work back in, in the 2000s. Let's go to the next slide. So the deal really, and as the name of the workshop is, the common unities, looking what you as a club might do, but also you might have the same unity as a nursery or as a charity or as a business. And bringing those things together to have the common unity. Because community is that word, common unity put together. It's finding a similar or values that are the same that can therefore complement and work together um, to, I suppose, win-win of who you're working with. And then a good example of this, I'll share with you about uh, one club that I've worked with. So one club, as an example, they have volunteer-based committee, but they needed some expert skills. Just so happened, they found out that one of the organisations on their doorstep offered those skills. It was accountancy. Hey ho, put the two together. They get what they need, but therefore the accountancy also got some new business as well. So it's just about linking those things together in a similar way, which therefore have a purposeful unity that can help fill a void or complement what each other's doing. And we go to the next one. I feel like Boris here saying next slide. But that's okay. So this is kind of what it looks like. And I've made it easy. I've put a club on there I know quite well. My daughter plays for this club called Cuford. Um, Cuford are based in Walheath and Kings Winford. That's in Dudley. Um, and looking at where that club is, and dependent on where you are, you might look put a radius on it of what's on your doorstep. So for an example, I've used a circle on the map at the bottom there of a two-mile radius what's there and what do we currently know about or don't and that could be segregated into five areas and the model i've used just a bit of an adaption of the original one so the five areas that we'll look at over the series of webinars is one physical spaces now probably like your clubs you probably all have a pinch point about training venues where you can use etc because as you go in clubs there's probably not a much indoor space that you need. There might not be enough grass pitches, etc. But some other places might have that. So physical spaces is one, meeting rooms, etc. Your local economy. So what are the businesses? What's the industry like by where you live? Is there opportunities to develop what you're doing in line with that? Complement either way. But do you know them? And you know, a really simple one, and, and the reason why I put Cupid on here is the example. If they just did simple surveys of parents, where do they work? And those work things then became a local economy map of how they could develop more relationships with business. Now, that's just a, such a simple idea. It became what's called a Cuford card. And that just enabled discounts or other people to use. But hand in hand, it complemented and supported the club as well. So what's your business? What's your area like where you are? Individuals and networks. Now, this is a real key one. The next week, I've got a real good example for you to share about how using what's out there to help you. So we're going to be talking a lot about um, charity sector. We're going to be talking about organisations, but also other circles that's not football. Because sometimes in the football circles, we just get football outcomes and answers, which is fine on the pitch. But it's the off the pitch things that can help you grow, sustain uh, and really retain what you're doing. And as a club next week, we're going to tell you some of their good work that they're doing in the greater Manchester region. Institutions. Um, this for me, probably uh, one of my areas of expertise, but really hard sometimes, isn't it, to 
get into schools, colleges, universities, as the example, because sometimes it's about finding the right person, or do they have the right person or not? Sometimes it's quite time consuming because if you're a club with volunteers, whose job is it? Where do you find that? Sometimes it might be phone calls in the day, but yet you've got your job in the day. So it's going to give you a little bit of insight in how to work that better and get those shared outcomes that can therefore be helpful um, for what everyone's wanting. We're also going to talk a little bit wider about that, about working with the NHS, uh, saving some money on society, so joint outcomes about well-being, um, mental health is the example, uh, looking at provisions that your club could do that could save someone else some money elsewhere. And we're also, also going to share some stuff about working with uh, faith centres, uh, police, fire services, etc., that can therefore help and complement both ways what your club does and what those institutions do. Uh, the final segment on there is heritage and culture. So, you know, we live in England. We're a multicultural society. Uh, a football club by me in Smethwick will be very different to a football club in Cannock. And that's just down to what your geographics and heritage and culture is of your area. There are some clubs who've worked really well with that and developed partnerships maybe with faith centres, with leaders of that. And, you know, just a range of different ways that football has complemented each other. And on our uh, webinar with that theme, we will be sharing some good examples of a club who's done that really well, uh, linked with madrasas and faith centres in Lancashire. So that's a bit of the overview of what we're going to be going through. And hopefully it helps spark some ideas with what you're doing in your club and how in the future you might have a little action plan that can help. One thing just to touch uh, base back with Danielle here is, is the Football Foundation and Sport England as the example, uh, as kind of the major funding bodies in the sector, are really looking at how in the future partnership work with community will be a part of their funding strategy and how they help and support clubs, especially in football. So bear this kind of stuff in mind for your future developments of what you might want to do. Evidencing and developing this stuff will really help you. And the next slide. And the key message really to kind of underpin this is it's a two-way street. I can imagine that some of you have had banged your head against the wall that someone didn't get back to you. You dropped an email and you made a phone call. It didn't work or, or whatever. So it's looking at how you as a club also, you know, use what you do in your services to complement other community organisations, institutions, etc., rather than just them complementing you. You'll tend to find if you have the win-win uh, approach to it, you'll get the better outcomes. So what I mean by win-win is, is that if you get something, but they get something, you're probably more likely to build that longer lasting relationship rather than you just having something and they not getting something back. But I think that's a pretty much of a given of a underpinning strategy, really, uh, of what's happening there. So for us, really, this overview of what ABCD is, asset-based community development, is about looking at those strengths, looking at what's there that can complement each other, mapping, looking at the assets and mobilising uh, where it might be needed or, on the other hand, where it can complement it's driven from the community within itself. So looking at your club and where you're situated will really help. And if I could introduce my friend here, Becky, who I think is there. Say hello, Becky, if you're there. Hi, are you all right? I am all right. Thank you, Becky. Good, good. I've segued in nicely for you yeah, to tell us all about the great work of Solly or Moors in the community. It was a lovely introduction, thanks. And a lot of what you've said, I'm probably going to reiterate. Uh, just to give you an introduction about myself and my role. So, um, as it says, I'm Becky Fox and I'm the head of community at Sully or Moors. Um, I've been in post now for 18 months. So, um, still learning and it's ever evolving. Um, my role is I think quite different because I am not responsible for any of the football side. 
So in some ways that is a blessing for me when it comes to community, just to give you um, just a overview of my background. So I'm social worker trained and worked in um, various fields from um, safeguarding to uh, disability. And then I spent a few years managing charities. So that knowledge I feel has, has helped me in my role at Sully or more. So I'll just give you a brief introduction to Sully or Moors and what we wanted to grow. So I was, um, I'd ex I would describe the community at the club at Sully or Moors as a community driven club and it's accessible. So we pride ourselves on being friendly and being inclusive and that has been our priority. So not only do we offer inclusion on match days, uh, the normal things that you would expect to see at a football club, but actually we look in, we look off off the pitch and look kind of at um, more than football, as I've said. So one of our priorities has been around engagement. And I know that Danielle and Russell have, uh, have both touched on it, but our priority in order for our community to grow as it has done has been around communication and dialogue and collaboration. And I would say that has been um, kind of the best thing to grow that we, what we do, what I'm going to share with you about. Um, and the key for me, if, if you're just starting looking at how to grow, I would say look at partnerships, talk to your council commissioners, talk to your NHS, look what's out there, use your not only your fan base, but use kind of schools and other community providers and partners to show you where there's a gap or where you can work together or actually where you could provide something a little bit different. Um, another thing that I found useful is looking at local businesses because a lot of them have social responsibilities and they want to help you. They don't want to reinvent a wheel. Sometimes they want to work in partnership with you or get you to um, do something on their behalf. And that helps because none of us have a bottomless pit of money, do we? And uh, we want to use that investment wisely. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll go into the NHS stuff a little bit later for you. I just saw that question. Um, and I would say the best way to describe the community work is a bit of a bridge. So a bridge between the club and the community and the people. You use, you use your Saturday football and your sessions to access other people. And also you use the com community side to deliver grants. And Russell also tapped into talking about volunteers. And when it comes to community, we look at sustainability and we'll talk a little bit about that later on as well, how you can use your volunteers to help you to continue the, the work that you do. So if we must just move on to the next slide, if possible. Oh, and the next one, sorry, I talked a little bit introduction through what we've done. So we, we, I found one of the first things that we had to do when we were looking at our community was doing some research, looking, like I said, at what was offered, what would attract the, the wider community and what would be a key thing for us was to be diverse, to stand out and to do something that was welcoming and friendly and would break the stereotype. So I had the beauty off for me when I went into the football club because I never worked in that field. Um, I could look at it with fresh eyes. So sometimes it would be useful um, to get somebody in, a volunteer or somebody to actually look at things differently, question. What would you like to see from from a community project? What would you like to see? And with that, we came up with these areas. These are our areas that we're focusing on within the community at Sully or Moore. So health and well-being, education, employment and volunteering, and community and social cohesion. So you might think, well, where do I start? And I'm not going to talk a lot about football tonight, but obviously we used our obvious audiences to generate interest and to get the word out and to get those conversations flowing and, and using things like, if you see over, I'll give you a little bit of our the next slide. If you see, we used our youth and juniors because we'd already got that existing work going on in order to attract others, we talk to parents, we talk to grandparents, we talk to the, the kids themselves, what what they what, what they did outside of school, what what they'd love us to do within the club that wasn't just football. And we got a 
intelligence and we also used some of our our players in our football and education who'd come from our youth and junior teams to be part of our community volunteering so they came and helped us with running football sessions and in return we trained them in in level one or that offered them other employability aspects so that's how we kept some of our continuous staff and our volunteers and then the other group that was an obvious group to help us can we have the next slide was our ability counts group um which at, at study on moors we pride our, pride ourselves on we have a good disability squad uh, that ranges that with a range of disabilities and a range of groups and we've been able to grow this and expand this um and almost tailor it so that's a lot of what we we did to initially start in growing our community so we'll go to the next slide but one of the things that we did find that even though we were delivering on our, our football and education our youth and juniors and our disability like like russ said we had to do that common unity we had to blend our values and our aspirations as a community and our aspirations were around inspiring, engaging and educating. And therefore, in order to grow our community, we set up and developed our charity that, that recognised what we'd done, but also recognised that we wanted to grow more and we wanted to offer more within our local community. We found that it helped doing a charity because actually it was the obvious, it came with the obvious, it raised our profile, it brought in funding it helped when we wanted to talk to local businesses about sponsorships of certain projects but also it grew a partnership partnership and partnership working so we found that other charities wanted to work with us we found that actually it was easier to determine what work was already being done that we could tap into and support and also where there was gaps in the market uh, we worked obviously within the club doing the the more obvious things like feeding projects, like um, food collections on match days, um, like doing sponsored events for Help the Heroes or other charities to raise their profile as well. But also it enabled us to put more opportunities on for all. So that's why we, we formed the charity that actually our values would be spread across other charities, but also it would give us more scope for growth that wasn't just around football or sport it was around community cohesion cohesion and engagement so the next slide if possible so some of our activities that we do within the charity and community um, and some of them yeah are a little bit textbook but i'll talk through some of them would, that we're doing a little bit different that makes us kind of stand out a bit more and why sometimes people are engaging with us a little bit more so Within Sullyall now, we're in 25 local schools, and that's not just offering your generic breakfast clubs, lunchtime sessions, or after school clubs, but also we have kind of targeting projects. So we have six week projects that we're running within schools that talk about anti-bullying, um, healthy lifestyles, um, supporting attendance, supporting reading and writing campaigns and other projects like that that aren't necessarily about football but we use some of those football cores to help so each week we have a we have a six-week program that we deliver so it could be healthy pat luncher it could be exercise it could be even in one of the sessions we teach man, mindfulness and mental health to younger children to help them cope with what they're going through and within that as well, our community staff deliver it, but we also um, use some of our football players to come in as mentors who've done training with us around mental health and peer mentoring, that they come in and um, the children look up to them, the young people look up to them. And we find that because we, we speak to schools, we speak to youth centres, youth workers, and those are the key providers, the police, uh, that they tell us what's going going on and what the community worries and concerns are and we're able to write those projects at the moment we're about to start in a secondary school one a project around knife crime because in our area at the moment knife crime is prevalent and um, we're going to be going in and delivering with some core students around that we also are focused on 
in regards to knife crime, social inc inclusion and looking at our young people who we know are not in school or who are struggling um, and are in pupil referral units. And we've part partnered with the council and with schools and are now um, running employability courses at the club and education courses where they come and they do as Dan and other qualifications. Uh, they volunteer on match days. They come down and get involved in our projects. And it means that at the end of it, um, they've got a qualification that, that actually allows them to go on into employment or further education. And in some aspects, we're finding that we've got three of those young people who are now, we're employing them on a sessional basis to be involved in coaching our other children and doing peer mentoring projects. We found with this, I know I briefly touched on partnership, and we recently got a grant from the, the National Lottery. And the reason it was successful is because um, we, we raised um, a community, we, ra we applied for a community grant, a joint communities together grant. And because three of us as a charity applied and we put a three year plan in around um, focusing on people with disabilities who, who were no longer in school and looking at not just their mental health, but actually their education and their fitness, um, that actually we were successful. So I'll give you an example for, for us. We focus on the fitness, offering one-to-one -one PT sessions, health and wellbeing sessions. We have um, an employability charity that focus on training and putting those young people in employment and disability training places. And then we have um, a counselling charity that focused on mentoring and put, giving them therapy. And that was something that's successful that we've been able to go on doing um, mental health work with those young people and they're coming back to our projects. And we found within the club, we offer the club and it's open all the time as a bit of a hub, a social prescriptor that those young people can come in that when they're feeling low, when they're feeling they've got nowhere to access, they can come in and have that safe space to talk to our community peers and our volunteers. We're also at the moment offering something with Sully or Carers Trust. I know I said about thinking differently and working with providers who don't have the manpower to deliver things. So the Carers Trust are a small charity within Solihull and they found that they wanted to offer rest children and young people who care for parents, but they didn't have a venue. They had no staff. All they had was a little pot of money as it were to deliver it. And because we have the staff and the venue, we've been able to work with them and offer something. So, so it is a win-win partnership that is growing. So for us, yes, we still have to be sustainable, sustainable financially, but actually we're target, targeting a different audience and we're doing things a little bit differently. So if we go into the next slide, I briefly talk to you about our community hub. So in the daytime, we now use the club as a bit of a community hub so it's multi-purpose uh, we're fortunate that we have an agreement with the club service level agreement that we're able to use it as as a, at a minimal cost um, so we're offering things a little bit different like coffee mornings we're offering a dementia uh, morning once a month where um, uh, age concern or residential homes bring their their elderly people in and we're doing activities sometimes we do chair fitness sometimes we do uh, bingo um, and recently we did a history talk so we did a history talk all about football and the history of Sully on Moors um, so it's just about looking at that we also have a local day centre that hire a room from us and we offer activities for them so we may do football or some sporting things but again it's bringing income in because they hire it for the whole day and again it's that the club is open and it's part of the community so the NHS come in and they do their diabetes clinics or they do health and well-being and deliver so sometimes it's not about manpower it's just about having a venue and it's the partnership we also do the simple things like food collections are in a partnership with a local charity that deliver food around for the homeless, uh, for those low income families. And then we also are just about to start a play and support group for mums, because one of the obvious gaps that we had 
was that fathers were coming and we were having predominantly males who were using the club all the time. So we've made one of our bars a little bit more friendly that it that it is a coffee room uh, where mums can come straight after school because that's one of the important things that we found actually. If we put something on first thing in the morning, we have local schools near us, that actually the mums will come and have a cup of coffee and bring their toddlers. So again, it's another audience that we haven't used before. And we're also attra attracting grandmas now because we do uh, something called knit and natter. So Rush, you might want to come along to that when we're able to um, to up again and have a natter. But again, I'm it's bringing it. grandmas in. It's bringing different people in. So we've got a wider audience. And another thing that we found uh, when we initially were a charity, not all the fans had heard about what we do as a community. And then when we, we got our charity status and we were able to use that, actually fans know a lot more about us now. They're engaging with us a lot more and actually they're coming up. We've got a good partnership with the supporters club who are actually putting on quiz nights. Uh, we're actually recently we did a ladies pamper night where we did shopping and beauty treatments and a gin and, gin and tonic cocktail table and actually we're finding that our funds increase, which means we're able to put more back into the community. Um, touching back on one of our biggest um, successes that has been recently has been around our bereavement groups and our mental health. So we found that um, we wanted to do something predominantly um, within mental health. Um, because we'd had a lot of inquiries about it and, and people contacting us saying, did we offer anything? Could we signpost to people? So obviously mental health and bereavement wasn't our expertise, but within partnership, we were able to talk to um, Sully or Mind uh, who were wanting some support around football. So what we did is we offered our club and our coaches um, with a little bit of funding that we we jointly wrote a bid and our coaches coach for a session and then we offer the club and um, the Soil on Mind mentors come and they run their sessions there, their groups there that actually the guys can come without that taboo of having to go to a doctor's clinic, having to go to, to a hub where people know why they're there and they're able just to talk um, but also have that that fitness session that actually not only looks after their body but looks after their their mind as their mental health and gives them kind of a positivity and a sense of confidence and achievement that they're doing something um we also alongside that spoke to um sand united and a local dads group who um had been kind of wanting something where they could play sport and actually be around to have a ood expert experience bereavement um, so again they come and and it's run through our volunteers again uh, they come they have their football session and they've recently just joined a football league that actually they're not just having that time away from home to train but actually they're playing other other groups and they're kind of not isolated but actually they're included within you know other groups and other football teams which has been brilliant and we've seen that grow um and i think one of the successes again of that is actually because we've just offered the club the club is there and the guys can talk um and do those social conversations without the obvious why they're all there um i think again touching on it without volunteer input we wouldn't have the manpower to help at every session and it's really important that you get that right and actually that you look at how you you engage with fans to keep them to use your local fans use your local volunteer forums that's one thing that i've learned the past six months is actually i've built up a good relationship with the local solial volunteers committee and they kind of signpost and bring volunteers to us that actually are staying and where I struggle to get things done sometimes around social media, around evaluations, collecting that evidence, around stats, they're able to help as well as those who do the physical helping with the delivery of the sessions. So I would say the 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 greatest things that I've learned about pushing our community and looking at how we do it differently is actually take your football glasses off. Um, look at 
what's out there on what could be achieved you know make your community hubs a little bit more friendly so the reason we're getting women through the doors now to the mums and toddlers to the knit and natter is actually because we've changed one of the rooms if you can you know make it a little bit more friendly user friendly whether that's putting a comfy sofa or you know actually making sure that you can get tea and coffee um or that actually there is a quiet room where you can deliver those other things I would say try something different. Think outside the box. You know, network and partner partner with other charities, with other communities. Talk to your funders, and then make it accessible to all. So, great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for that. I mean, it's lots right. of great insight. I've seen some of your work uh, firsthand and the difference that you make. And if we just go to the next slide, just to show everyone who's on the call. So as part of some of the support with the club last year, uh, we did what's called an SROI uh, survey, which is basically a social return on investment. Now, everything that your volunteers or your club might do has a value. It might not be a monetary value, but there is a cost equivalent. So an example being that, you know, every hour a volunteer might do, whether that be from setting up a goal to coaching to making tea whatever it is that might equate to 10 pounds as the example of what a volunteer cost is so effectively what solly all moors do equated to 1.5 million pounds worth of uh, social and economic value investment back into the local community now these are figures which aren't actual cash money but this really helps Solihull now be a place to go, do you know what, when we're working with partners, this is what we're doing. And this is how much actually we might be saving costs on society. And this is a really important point for you now, guys, because moving forward in a COVID-19 post world, there might be less money, there might be less funds, there might be less uh, grants shared and working together and showcasing the value and the impact you're making will be a big thing in how fundings, future work, partnerships might be evaluated and evidenced. Next slide, please, that's all right. Uh, Becky's contact details will be on there for you. If there's any of the specifics that you'd like to add to, I did notice there was a conversation about Man City offering a disability uh, get together, which I'm pretty sure Becky will take up because that sounds like a really good gig for those guys of Solihull to go there. Of, of course, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, ultimately, Solihull's might be a very different place to where you guys and your clubs are. Some of this good work doesn't happen, though, without that wider institute help. And if we just go to our next slide and we introduce Luke here. Um, Luke Bowles um, from Birmingham County FA, I've got to say, he's really supportive of the work that clubs like Solly all do, people like me doing my role, and the wider understanding of community is a really key thing, especially from our County FA in Birmingham. This is one of our strengths. So I'll hand over to Luke just to talk you through a little bit about their support and some of the things they've done. Even though, can you hear me, Russ? I can hear you. Perfect. Even though, um... Obviously, thanks, Russ, for the introduction, uh, and thanks, Becky, for obviously such a great insight into to the work that Solly or Moores are doing across across your community and your local authority. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background around me, I've been at Birmingham FA now for just over five years. Um, been in a number of roles across across the sort of business. Um, still involved in football at a grassroots level, so I coach, a referee, I run my own club, and I also sit on a league committee. So I sort of span the whole sort of workforce area that we, we really cover at a grassroots level. Um, I'm just going to sort of touch on what we're doing as a county FA in terms of finding something new, which was the theme that Russ touched on at the start of this presentation. So as a county FA, we cover an area um, that spans 15 local authorities. Um, and in that area, we have 3.3 million people and we cover three cities. Um, in the Midlands, it's it's quite a, a diverse um, sort of area, really. Um, we have people from different religious backgrounds. We have a high BAME population and we have a lot of new and emerging communities. So in terms of us, 
what we're looking to do as a county FA over the next sort of 12 to 24 months is actually look at our non-consumers. So which areas of society aren't actually engaging with their local football clubs, their local leagues, and aren't engaging in our beautiful game? So some of the work that we've been doing over the last 12 months is actually mapping um, our demographic and looking at certain areas that we can tap into using our clubs, leagues, and also our FA initiatives. So some of the areas are there that we've done previously that are on the screen. So we've got um, quite a large Muslim population, especially in the city of Birmingham. Um, and over the last two to three years, we've run um, Ramadan leagues to support our Muslim players. Um, this might be something that you might want to take back to your clubs and leagues, especially those that do have a, a high um, Muslim population. Because during Ramadan, obviously, uh, quite a high number of people fast and can't actually take part or struggle to take part in, in normal physical activity. Um, this year, we've had clubs that have been doing um, some online sessions around um, Ramadan and, and having some high high scale uh, people to come in and do talks to their sort of consumers that, that take part in the Ramadan League. Some of the other stuff that we've been doing, um, we've been we've been hosting a monthly dementia cafe, uh, and you'll see the picture on the screen. Um, we tend to get around eight to fifteen uh, people turn up that take part in these sessions, and we try and get a new guest speaker every month um, to come and talk to the to the people, and it's more like a, a memory session. So we ask them to bring some items of memorabilia that they can talk about and speak about, and that's gone down really well. And we're now. Um, opening this up to a lot of our grassroots and uh, grassroots clubs and our community trusts of our foundations. We also do a lot of work in terms of supporting charities. Um, and we also have a charity uh, that sits alongside our county FA um, that we try and obviously offload certain funds into different parts of the community. But in terms of the work that we're looking to do over the next 12 to 18 months in, in terms of finding something new, we want to look at our non-consumers and, and this is where it will relate back to you as, as clubs and leagues. Who are you, you need to find out who are your non-consumers. So who are the people in your community that aren't currently, currently engaging in your football club, whether that's from a, a fan's perspective, whether that's from a workforce perspective, or whether that's, a, whether that's as a participant perspective. So some of the schemes that we're looking to set up over the next sort of 12 to 18 months include restaurant leagues, because we have a high number of restaurants across our three cities, which are Coventry, Birmingham and Wolverhampton. We're looking at setting up taxi leagues for taxi drivers, and this might not necessarily be on a weekend because it's prime time for them, which is where our normal football takes place. We might be looking at a Tuesday morning. Um, which seems to be the common theme at the moment, which might take place uh, on a 3G, such as the one at Solihull Moor site. So we're bringing football back into that, back into that site and bringing non-consumers to engage in, in football related activity. We're also quite privileged that we have seven HE institutes, so higher education, so that's universities, and we have 20 designated further education institutes, so colleges. So we're also looking there, what skills and expertise do people have within, within those uh, education establishments or people are studying that we can bring out and integrate across our grassroots environment? So this is including uh, people from a business background, marketing background, people doing independent studies with some of our leagues. So if the leagues have um, sort of key themes that they want to try and um investigate or discover then people can come in and actually do this for you one of our most successful initiatives has been our business league and this might relate to obviously you as football clubs and also leagues we have 30 11 v 11 teams taking part um in our business league and the good thing for us is we've been able to make commercial partnerships but we've also been able to find businesses that can actually benefit our grassroots clubs and have been able to, to put offers out um, some of our grassroots clubs from the partnerships we've made. Some of the, um, the, the, some of the businesses are actually attached or, or span from some of our grassroots clubs. 
But longer term, if, if the business league continues to grow, and this is where the leagues that are on the call, this is something you might want to talk about with your county FA, there's opportunity there for leagues to take on extra divisions, but not in your typical adult male Saturday afternoon football league or not your typical um, grassroots youth league. It might be extra divisions actually catering for these non-consumers because ultimately you're already running football leagues and you're the people with the expertise on how to run leagues. Whereas a lot of these new and emerging communities actually won't have experienced what we call traditional football before. So by working with our um, established clubs and our established leagues, um, it can help them, well, it can help the participants have a platform for football without having to actually start all over from, from, from scratch. So it might be worth engaging with your county FA to find out how, as a club or as a league, you can potentially support some of this, this new activity that might be within your county FA's operational plan for the, for the, for the next season. We're quite fortunate because I'm, I'm going to refer to Solihull Moors because they're on the chat. But essentially, as a county FA, we've started a number of over 45s walking football leagues and obviously the business league. And Solihull Moors have been fortunate enough as a club to take some of these um, non-consumers, as we'll call them, in-house and actually affiliate their teams under their club banner. That way it brings in um, people under the, the Solihull Moors names, name and exposes them to, to the club and the offer, the offer that they can provide. And this, in turn, supports some of the charitable aims that they have. Um, but ultimately, what I'd suggest that you do as a club and league is actually engage with your county FA because we do have fresh ideas and, and we are willing to listen. And also have a look at actually finding something new in your community. And actually, could you be the person that influences a startup or influences change? But apart from that, I don't want to take up too much time. But if anyone does want to get in contact directly, then I'm sure Danielle will share um, my email address around when she shares the um, slides. And if you do want to chat for anything further, then please feel free to drop me an email. Thanks, Luke. Um, I'd probably say, you know, in terms of my multitude of hats and roles, um, the help and support of the institution to kind of join and fill the gaps is really good to have. Because it could be that sometimes you as a club, you have a relationship that might only be for discipline, as the example with your county FA. You've got your county FA support for workforce development, etc. It can make a big difference. Uh, some of the initiatives, especially in my committee role as the SDYFL uh, with Luke, have been really helpful. Um, but also in that community bit of my football life, that's football development, whether that be university, whether that be grassroots, whether that be for regeneration, that can really make a difference that they can help to plug the gap there. So thank you, Luke, for that. Uh, next slide, if you don't mind. So let's go back to what we said. Tonight's a really broad overview of the next three webinars. We're really going to be nailing down on some of the areas of ABCD, asset-based community development. And we're really going to unpick next week the power of individuals and your networks and those business and that local economy and the difference it can make. The club we've got next week is Ashton from uh, Greater Manchester. And some of the work that they've done really underpins, backs up and complements what you've heard tonight. Using um, voluntary sector organisations to you know, help you with your workforce. Using business to complement and make new relationships. So you're going to hear in about that next week. Uh, the following one from that on will be about working with the schools, the colleges, police, NHS, unpicking a lot of the things you've heard today. And I've noticed on some of the chats, which we'll have questions soon about, how hey, do you work with the NHS? How do we make that happen? And, you know, it's, it, it's not through luck. Some of the expertise there actually helps them save money. So it's more likely that they might use you with partnership and you use them. Uh, and lastly, we'll be talking uh, about the physical spaces, the people you work with, your culture and your heritage. And from a phone call we had earlier, I believe, Danielle, we got the Football Foundation on with us there as well, talking about what life looks like for them in terms of how they're going to be 
supporting clubs in their developments in the future post COVID nineteen, really. And our next one. So we're opening the floor, Daniel. I'll put it back to you. If there's any bits where we kind of link back to our audience here, and I thank you guys for for listening. Hopefully, you could understand the Black Country tones. Um, you, you can now know the difference. You heard Luke; he's a Brummie. You heard me; I'm from the Black Country. It's very different. So, if there's any questions that you'd like to know or ask, I saw some on the chat. Now is our time. Thanks, Ross, Becky, Luke. Um, huge thanks. I think it's been echoed in, in the chat. So uh, really well done, guys. Some really thought-provoking information that you've shared this evening that um, I think a great summary here um, by Elle Dorling is just around the fact that you've enabled very thought-provoking ideas that have given a different sl slant on our traditional roles as clubs and leagues. So I think that's really powerful. So big well done to you three. So as Ross mentioned, there are a few comments um, and questions in the chat, which is fantastic. So as we uh, rattle through them, if anything pops to mind, please do pop it in the chat and I will direct it um, to Becky, Luke or Ross. So um, let me try and go to the top first. As you mentioned, Ross, and we'll start with that one. Um, Anita's asked the question, how would you um, include the NHS um, and what sort of collaboration could could that look like? So possibly both for yourself, Russ, and for uh, Becky, because obviously Becky alluded to a few NHS initiatives as well. So, so I'll it. start you, I'll start you off and then I'll hand over to the person that knows more than me. Right. <laughs> so I don't know about great, that. <laughs> great question. Ultimately. Um, one of the terms that you may be aware of or you may not be is what's called social prescribing. So this is kind of a new term in the world of sports development and, you know, community asset planning, really. And what this means is, is most people that go to the doctors don't need the doctors. They just need more connection, a bit more physical activity and maybe some support there. But if you think about how much it costs to go to the doctors, then social prescribing is about using that money better. And most NHS trusts and partnerships have social prescribing contracts um, aligning with some of the work that actually doesn't need to happen in the doctors. So an example being um, someone who might be recovering from an operation might be at a point where they don't need a registered phys physiotherapist. They might just need some activity that could be done at your football club if you have that provision for. So an example, it could be uh, walking football, as an example. Now, if you're in a place that offers such services and signposting, this will therefore put your club in a good place to be an NHS partner. And it's just about mapping what you can offer and what you can do in line and making sure that your doctor's surgeries and your NHS trust and partnership know about them. And it's an easy segue to happen because what you're doing does help reduce inactivity, obesity, uh, reduce mental health, aligns in with some of the bits around um, recovery. So it's a wide range of things that you can do, but to map it and just like, get in contact with your partnership managers from the NHS. Now, Becky, what, tell us about one of the programmes that you've done and how that worked. Well, did you get in contact with them? How did it work? Yeah, so one of the projects that we uh, ran um, a few months back, I um, made contact with the commissioners in Sully or Council so, um, and shared with them around what facilities we'd got, how we wanted to engage in the community and shared our strategy with them and experience. And... Um, and I was introduced to the commissioner who, in regards to health, and um, asked her where there was gaps in the market, what, what the council's priority was around health. Um, and the commissioner had said that, obviously, one of the priorities was around males, getting males into exercise and dealing with obesity. So I was able to share with them one of, we do a project called Moore's Vitality, which is a bit like man versus fat. So we offer uh, training, we offer health sessions um, and just help promote healthy lifestyles, keeping active and losing weight. Um, and the council referred me to um, 
obviously the health commissioner who in turn um, said, can you run a project for us? And um, our posters and our course was shared to GPs within Sulliol and practitioners within the hospital. Um, and we had a group of, of males who came to us. And from that, from us running that project, actually more GPs and more directorates heard about us and um, local chari charities like Diabetes UK. So that's why we've ended up hosting things like a diabetes clinic down at the club. Uh, we hosted something for the British Heart Foundation at the club. And it's simple things like that that actually we're getting to know um, different NHS priorities and different commissioning priorities that actually we can tender and write bids for or we're able to say this is what we already do and get referrals directly into the clubs. And it might sound scary, the word commissioning and stuff like that, but ultimately if you start with a small project and you show it's made a difference, these networks of doctors, uh, NHS charities, etc., it's just like football clubs, but they're working in with help. They'll talk to each other and they'll recommend and signpost, which will help you if you've already done something and can showcase what you've done. I would agree with that and echo that. And if you can get it out there, and this would be a helpful hint for you, if you get one little project that you think, oh, it's only a couple of weeks or actually it's just one session, but actually if you get that right and you get that evidence that I know we're all busy in our jobs, but actually if you get the time to share it on social media, to actually tag other charities and other bits in your name does get, get further and the work that you're doing and your reputation is built. I agree with that. And listen to the work, you know, the, the webinar about institutes because you could get your universities to evidence it for you as well. But that's a different bit. Should we go to the next question, Danielle? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's very streamlined because we've had a really good question from Stuart um, around the, the approach and contact in schools and, and almost what's what's the best method um, to, to kind of get into schools, because sometimes it can be quite difficult. Um, as with everyone at this moment in time, things are really busy um, and sometimes schools at, with with other organisations maybe find it difficult to have some some spare time to, to open the door and have conversations. I mean, we've got a really good answer um, from Anita around just working with your PE department um, in yeah. schools. But Russ, I don't know if you want to elaborate any more to help Stuart out. Yeah, around yeah. That approach the, into schools. The best way to get any acknowledgement from any school is to find out how many of your kids in your club go to that school. And once you've got that information, I'm telling you now, your people who are in charge there will listen to you. If it's just we are a club, blah, blah, blah. If you know that, say, for an example, 27 of our students are of this club, etc., then it's worth knowing that because schools are measured differently. and Some of them are measured on some of their social community remits as part of Ofsted. But I don't want to give you too much away here because we're going to be talking about that on our third webinar. But I'd probably say the best win for me is find out which how many of your kids in your clubs go to that school. And I think you turn heads and you get more attention. Brilliant. Thanks, Russ. We've got another uh, great supportive comment as well, just saying uh, maybe get in touch with your local council. This is what one club did. I think it's Coville. Um, got in touch with their local council and they managed to, to connect them um, to a number of schools, which is great. So I guess it's just, as, as you've mentioned, as Luke's mentioned, as Becky's mentioned, it's just widening your network, looking at your assets, understanding who is uh, who else is out there outside of your club that might be able to uh, to connect you in with different opportunities. So uh, another great yeah. supportive answer there, which is brilliant. I suppose I'll just add to that with a bit about schools is sometimes, you know, clubs contact with schools is about what can they do for you? So can I have a facility or whatever it is? And I'm only talking generically here because I'm sure some of you do some great work. But it's the other bit, really. What, what, what can you do for them? Because that widens it then. And a lot of good examples I've seen in the past, and Luke might be able to jump in on here, is where actually clubs have used what they have really well, you know, those good coaches, role models, mentors, etc. It can actually benefit the school too with kind of that signpost provision or complementing what they do. I mean, Luke, in your past, are you good examples you come across? Yeah, I think there's quite a few good examples, really. Um, you've got to look at, first of all, 
what can you offer the school? So have you got anyone that, for example, might work a night shift that might be able to pop in on one of their days and go into a school assembly to signpost? Um, schools like to see clubs that are very visual. Is there any, are there any assets that you can provide them, whether it might be, uh, even if it's a sign just to say that your local club is, or some leaflets at the start of term to say, we're your local, we're your local club, um, first session free, tr like sort of come, come and try, come and have a taster session. I, th I think that the main thing is you've always got to find, and this is a key word that I use with any partnership, you've got to find the driver. So this is the key individual that you'll speak to on the other side of that partnership. So it's trying to find the right person in the school. In some schools, this might be the head teacher. In some schools, this might be the PE teacher. In some schools, it might be um, the teacher that might be interested in football or involved in, in, in football in, in some aspect. There's no, there's no person that's the same in all schools that will be the key contacts. So it's just trying to get a better understanding of what, what your local school looks like, really, and, and the best way to approach it. So we'll talk a bit more about that webinar three, but thank you for those questions in June. Absolutely right. The PE teacher will come across a lot of those kids that might be able to signpost and link in uh, and coordinate. Um, should we go to our next question? Yeah, great stuff. Thanks, guys. Um, so we've had a few that have asked for, I think, your uh, your contact details. I know Becky shared um, a few want to follow you on your social media channel. So um, I will double check with all of you guys that you're happy with that and that your content is good to share. <laughs> But we have had a really good question from Harry. So Harry's asked, in the form of building relationships within the community, from your experience, is there a best way to reach out to the community? And if so, how? Yeah, okay. So one thing that I've learned is that community's dead savvy. And what I mean by that, they'll be able to tell if you're only there for a quick book. And they'll be able to tell if you fly by night, you're there and you're gone. So you showing where you are, you're not going away, you're honest, you're in it to win-win is the best form of partnership and relationship building. And you now simple examples can be, I know one club that I've worked with in the past had a lot of problems about residents. So residents complaining about noise, um, balls going over fences, all, all this sorts of stuff, you know, low level stuff. However, no one from the club visited the residents. So effectively, it's a them and us situation. So by broaching the middle ground as an example there, talking to, finding out, sharing the story, win-win, what do we get, what do they get? Actually, the problem was you know, reduced and the residents roll on two years supported a planning application. So it's not about just going in when there's a problem and think that the asset-based community development kind of framework is about looking at the strengths of both sides and looking at how that can complement each other and making sure it's you know long term or building it on you can't beat people can you really i mean i bet loads of us have said over this 10 week period oh i wish i could see people I'm fed up a zoom or whatever it is the people's everything isn't it and using what you might have as strengths with relationships is all about the people those people skills are key and you know a really important comment i've heard um for years really is if, if you show that you care people are going to care what you know so rather than you just going in saying i know this well actually what does the other person know and building it from that you can really make a powerful long-lasting relation from that tip Thanks, Ross. Harry, I hope that answers your question. Um, we've had a few that aren't specific to this webinar, so um, I am going to park them. One around structures, um, kind of what the best structure is for, is for your club. I, I definitely recommend um, having a look at one of our legal firms that we commission to support Chart Standard Clubs, which is called Muckle LLP. Um, it's on our website as well, uh, the fa.com forward slash uh, get involved forward slash players forward slash club slash league. So obviously really, really uh, short that it is on the front of the presentation. That just gives you some guidance around what different structures are out there. 
um, and helps you weigh up the pros and cons of all of them. So I definitely recommend that if you're looking, Kieran, at different structures for your clubs, check that out. We've also had a few around facilities, um, just asking questions around them. Again, good resource to uh, initially signpost to is your local football facility plan. If you haven't heard of them, I would definitely suggest reaching out to your county FA. There will be a lead there that looks after facilities. So please do have a conversation um, with them. But if you can look at the local football facility plan for your local area or your county FA, that would be a good starting point just to understand maybe what the future vision is in the local area for facilities. Um, I guess some of those questions have been around uh, Becky's um presentation on Solly Moore's foundation and obviously being a charity so it's obviously really sparked some thoughts there around how clubs might structure differently um, and obviously the use of, of a great facility and just maximizing um, different connections and, and ways and means of delivering um, kind of football and additional outcomes in other ways so really good questions definitely around the topic but I would definitely recommend those two suggestions of Michael yeah. LLP yeah, go on, Russ. Sorry. Just, just to add. So, yeah, please do. This week's webinar, date is king. So we're going to share a lot about that, about skills, networks. How do you find out about stuff? Because sometimes we just operate in the world of football, and we don't know. And then you know we might be have a chance to apply in for some money or grants or whatever. And then we're asked the question, "Well, what you need?" And then you're like, "Well, I don't know. I've got to find all this information out from wherever." But it is all there. And one of the things we will be sharing next week is about those skills, those networks that you can get into that, for an example, can tell you population mix of where you live, um, facility plan like you've mentioned there. Because the Football Foundation facility plan, when I read the one at Dudley, I was like, I never knew that. And I learnt stuff because it's all there collated for you. But it's, sometimes it's like the wood for the trees, really. And if you're a volunteer or you're part of a committee structured, for example, you, you might not ever see it, but maybe using those skills and networks to build that base of evidence you've got will really help you with the community outcomes that you're trying to get in the future. Really, So we can you know, touch base on that and share some places like active partnerships, for an example. And you know, football I don't, doesn't work that well in my experience with them. And these are Sport England funded organisations in every um, area of the country, which has so much data and insight that can help and shape you to your future work to get more people active, more people playing, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. But you wouldn't know about it unless you went out there to look for it. So it's how we can collate and help you out with that stuff as well next week. And I think that leads on really nicely, um, especially around the active partner element from a question from Alan from Stafford Rangers, just intrigued by the kind of business networking and community links and um, wanting to know a little bit more around how many clubs maybe do run business clubs and networking organisations. And I know I led that question around the active partners because uh, the active partners do host those types of events but I don't know if Becky if, if you um at your club have, have hosted any kind of business networking events or Luke from a county perspective if you know of anyone locally or you've potentially organized a, a type of event like that which uh might be useful for Alan to know of I think I think just before they jump in I'll help you out and translate folks active partnerships used to be called county sport partnerships CSPs there's a lot of acronyms in the world of sport, yeah. So they changed their name a year ago. County Sports Partnerships are now called Active Partnerships. Good translation. Thanks, Russ. <laughs> yeah, of course you can. Please do, Luke. So as a county FA, we work at the Chamber of Commerce. So yeah. obviously a lot of our business league um, information was sent out to the Chamber of Commerce, and that's where we managed to actually attract a lot of our teams from for, for the season just gone. Um, our business league season typically runs a differently to the grassroots season. It tends to be February to October, but we're looking to change that, put it in line with the season, obviously with the pandemic. Um, but essentially, one of the things that we are looking to do is actually try and get some of the business owners or some of the uh, senior executives from each of the business. They're sort of like a business cafe. So where we bring 
these individuals in, show them around, obviously, our county FA headquarters, talk to them a little bit about what we do, um, get them to actually share um, sort of business cards and, and, and sort of business practice with each other in the hope that actually they can they can see what we do and the, and the sort of charitable aims that we have, because obviously as a county FA, we're non for profit and actually see if they can buy in and actually impact our um, sort of grassroots landscape. Um, so that's something that we're planning to do halfway through next season. So we're probably looking around March time next year to do that. So I'm not sure how how that may work for a club, but it's something that obviously we can look into. But you, as a club, you might want to try and invite some of your local businesses in to do the same thing if you've got a a um, a clubhouse and, and actually talk around what you offer and, and how they can get involved. On the other hand, Luke, you know, the, the businesses do this anyway. So can you go to them? Can I tap into that and just say, um, for us, we we joined the Chamber of Commerce. So the club, I kind of piggybacked onto the club, uh, uh, kind of have that Chamber of They're a patron. And I kind of piggybacked onto that. And um, I go along to some of their their events and in turn the club host either it be a luncheon club or breakfast and I go along to a lot of those and introduce myself to a lot of the businesses um, and one of the things that I found really helpful is when we've not got much funding or we want to do specific projects um, I've been able to go in and do presentations around what are our priorities or actually um, I know um, Russ said get Get you in, you know, from active communities, get that intelligence around um, the landscape, the people, population, what the targets are. Um, and I found that that businesses from the Chamber of Commerce have, have said, well, actually, my social responsibility and my investment, I need to be given back. And they may make a donation towards the charity or actually they sponsor a specific piece of work. So my hint would be to you, if you can get in touch with your local Chamber of Commerce, um, introduce yourselves and say what you're about and how you want to support the community. Um, we found that they've been open and welcoming and actually I've used them to get our, our name, our brand as it were, um, out there and attract that audience and that investment. Absolutely. Brilliant, thanks guys. Good uh, good collective answer there. And. Um, I, not to put a downer on it, but Anil makes a really good point. It's all been really positive so far, but I, I guess this is possibly one to yourself, Becky, but have you had it, any bad experiences when you've tried to reach out to the community? And, and if so, because I'm sure that there has been, um, how did you go about kind of changing it and kind of getting that momentum to go again? Because I guess it is a challenge and you might face some barriers. So um, how do you go about it if, if you have had any bad experiences? It is. It is a challenge when you get a no or you get a knockback. Um, but I think, as Russ, Russ alluded to, um, one of the keys I, I found early on when I started in my role, I'd had an experience because I'd worked predominantly in in Solihull's kind of split north and south, and I'd worked predominantly in the north and came with these grand ideas of actually um, the issues that were stupidly from me and um, the issues that were happening in one side of the borough surely it was the same in the other um, and came in almost really eager to get things done and in some ways I almost ran before I could walk so I came up with lots of, of ideas that um, kind of I thought oh that would be great and actually worked in isolation um, so those initial conversations that I'd not backed up didn't work and I did find that I knocked on some doors and, and people didn't want to know and it is it is kind of um, hard but I found that actually once I widened and, and started having those conversations um, and actually just sitting and listening to people and actually looking what was out there um, that partnership opened and, and actually just taking the time to think it through to um, evaluate and ask those questions first before I start, I started going, oh, this would work, this would work, that that actually was better and actually just get a, a little bit more background as to what you're doing and, and what you want to deliver. Um, and as I said, just having those key conversations and those partnerships and, and being in some ways, once you've got that idea and you've got those partners, making sure you look at as a community what you can be strong in delivering because to build a community 
as Russ adhered to earlier, it's it's no good kind of kind of saying we're going to do this and we're going to do this and you can't deliver it. That would be my key thing. Make sure if you want to work in a specific way or you want to run a specific project, make sure that you almost have that plan before you get the funding or you get the go ahead that actually does make it sustainable, that you are able to deliver. Um, but also be prepared to tweak it a little bit that actually if it doesn't work right straight away we found when we started delivering some of our projects around um the elderly coming into the club we thought it, it would be quite easy you know invite them in and it would work but actually each week we had to tweak it because we hadn't thought a certain way around well actually that person might not like that or they might not like that um activity but every week it's learning and it's changing it and being adaptable. So I would say talk, do your research and be adaptable and then it will grow. I think to just to, to add to that, just to finish that one off is not everything's going to work. So the topic of this web of this webinar is do you have common unity? Some organisations you ain't going to have common unity with yet. But don't shut the door, keep the door open. Because when things are maybe going well, then they might be chasing you and that's OK. And not everything's going to work first time. And think of it as you've found the common unity, but it might not have worked yet. No, Russ, I can back that up that recently one of the charities that I talked with when we first started, we found that we were very different and we didn't think that actually we would come together. And now we're having conversations about a joint project. So I do uh, actually agree with that. Russ and back that up completely where I thought I'd never work with them we're now engaging in that conversation beautiful Danielle just on the on the chat I'm having a look through here sounds like June does, does some great work with the uh, Abraham Moss Warriors I like the sound of this NASA's NASA stuff with Tim Peak and a range of community work there so that might be a good one to uh just align in this part of Manchester because I think it's Cheetah Mill really is a, a good share so thanks June for sharing that yeah, no, that's brilliant. I, uh, I was actually just reading that um, towards the end of, uh, of you guys answering that question. And like you say, some really, really good stuff there. Um, and June keeps adding on, which is brilliant. So, uh, June, we might have to share your contact details as well if you carry on in that chat, because there's some really, really good, uh, really good suggestions there and some great work that you've been doing. Um, I'm flicking through and, and Russ, Becky, Luke, if you're on the chat and you can see anything I've missed, please do shout or if anyone's on the call and I haven't quite answered your question, please do uh, unmute yourself or forever hold your peace because there is a lot in there, which is brilliant today, guys. But if you uh, if you have got any other questions, please do pop them in now or unmute yourself. If I have accidentally forgotten or missed your question again, likewise, please do unmute yourself and uh, and fire away. Um, in terms of asking, so I'll just leave that for a couple of seconds, just if anyone does want to unmute or or add any additional uh, comments in the chat, please do so. Oh, oh, just while we sure wait. I was only joking, but great stuff. Thank you ever so much for sharing your details. That's really kind. So June's, uh, June's offered uh, support there. So if you've got any other questions or you'd like to uh, wrap June's brain, she's uh, very kindly put her contact details in the chat. That's great. Thanks, June. Sorry, Russ, I did interrupt you, I think. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say that um, a lot, some of your questions will probably be answered in the other webinars. Um, and again, the, the aim of the other webinars is, you know, if you think some of those areas you'd need further insight, data, best practice shares, etc., have a look at which of those themes are going to help you. Um, the whole point really is, is that post COVID-19, when we're back to normal, you are in a better place to have these conversations, develop, grow, sustain, build new relationships to help. Because you know what? Your core customers, there's going to be a lot of kids that, that might need different help and support that you can offer at present. You know, there's a lot of kids who ain't spoke to a teacher or anything for 10, 12 weeks. How can your club be that one shining light that gets them back in, but your football coaches might not have the way to do that. So it's going to be a different world. And this is a whole point of what this series is about, is to help you build, strengthen, and have a stronger community links for your club and league. Great. Thanks for us. I think that's um, really good 
good way to end. I can't see any more questions in the chat. Um, as I've mentioned before, all the contact details um, will be shared with you. So if you do have any questions, um, kind of when you go away today or when you chat with your committee or, or other people that support you, I mean, you'd like to ask something, please do so. The next webinar, as Russ has alluded to, will look at the ways in which you can begin to understand the power of your local community. Um, if you haven't registered your interest, I will share the link post um, this webinar along with all the recordings from this evening uh, and the web, uh, slide deck which has been presented to you. That just leads me to say a huge thank you very much to our um, two special guests, Becky and Luke. Your insight was absolutely fantastic, so thank you both very much. Russ, brilliant. Thank you very much for steering the ship. And to all of those that joined us this evening, thank you very much for your cooperation, your interaction. It's very much appreciated. And we look forward to welcoming you to the webinar next week. Thanks very much, everyone, and take care. Thanks, folks.